Hello. In this lecture, I am planning to talk about material requirement planning. First, um, I would like to introduce the concept of resource planning and enterprise resource planning. Then I'm planning to talk about the evolution of ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems. Then I, I would like to talk about the basics of MRP, material requirement planning, and bill of material, such as bill of material, master production scheduling. Okay, in, in the next part, later on, I am planning to talk about the types of lot size policies and MRP explosion. Let's first start with talking about resource planning because it's all about resource planning. So resource planning, as you can easily understand that, is about planning our resources in the company according to sales information or operations plans and using time standards. We talked about before, pro production routings, and other kind of information related to products, okay? And nowadays, many companies have been utilizing ERP systems, which are actually basic, uh, which are actually a simply software, about huge package, software package, okay? These ERP systems aim to integrate the firm's functional areas, such as accounting, human resources, uh, marketing, finance, of course, in, in the core, production department, research and development department, engineering department, quality department, and all other functional areas. All functional areas are integrated in one huge software package. Okay? Uh, it, it's, it has been used by many, many different types of organizations. Even nowadays, uh, some hospitals or uh, colleagues uh, are using ERP softwares and basically in these ERP systems basically in these ERP systems um, there is one single comprehensive database system which are, which was which is embedded in these systems and managers monitor all of the company's products or services at all locations because you know some 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 companies have different campuses different plans all around the world so they can easily monitor well, the data from each plant and as soon as we updated information it is updated in the main database so we can easily reach those data and see what's going on in each plant so we can streamline the data flows throughout the organization yeah. Okay, so we said that ERP integrates almost all functions of businesses, right? So, as I said before, human resources, manufacturing, accounting are located at the back office processes, and sales, marketing, customer service are located on the front office processes, and they are all integrated in ERP systems. Even the supply chain operations or logistics operations are included in this one. Let's take a look at the evolution of ERP systems. The evolution goes back to the inventory management and control systems back in 1960s. And then we developed material requirement planning to control how much or how many of uh, how many units of each dependent item is required to make an independent item. I'm, I'm going to be talking about the concept of dependent item because it's very critical to understand that in inventory management course, we should about independent items, right? We talk about how we can develop an optimal lot size policy for an independent item. For that purpose, we basically talk about EOQ model, economic order quantum model, right? So then, now uh, we had better to talk about dependent item in few minutes. I'm going to introduce what that means. And then, and then as the products get complex and businesses get more complex, then we developed 
I mean, we, I mean, the, the industry developed manufacturing requirements planning. We call it MRP2. And then the functions, the, the, some finance, finance, accounting, and some other types of functions are embedded in MRP2, and then they develop ERP packages. And at the beginning of 2000s, with the development of web or internet, then some web functionalities and some some um, after sales marketing functions such as CRM customer relationship management packages were included in ERP and then we got ERP2 or extended ERPs and nowadays even we are talking about cloud-based technologies in ERP so we can access any kind of data from anywhere and there is no single database in 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 a closed facility. Even on the road, our sales manager can sales managers can easily access the data in our ERP package. Hence, because MRP plays a very critical role in ERP softwares, we had better to understand the basics. We had to understand the core of ERP enterprise resource planning systems, okay, which is MRP materials requirement planning. MRP is a computerized information developed specifically to help manufacturers manage dependent demand inventory and schedule replenishment orders. Okay, so this is about controlling or planning planning how many items, how many dependent items, how many independent items should be planned to meet our customer orders. Well, in order to generate dependent demand inventory and scheduled replenishment orders, we are going to use master, plan, master, master production schedule for independent items. Then using bill of material, we are going to explode MRP and calculate, calculate how much they are needed. So this process is called MRP explosion. Okay? It's a process that converts the requirements of various final products or in the, the demand to uh, end items into material requirements plant. And at the end, we will specify the replenishment schedules of all the sub assemblies, components, and raw materials needed to produce final product. So MRP required three main types of inputs. The first input is the master production scheduling. This is the first one, which is also sometimes uh, integrated with the demand information and forecasting information. The second type of information is needed up to date inventory records, accurate and up to date inventory records, such as how many units I have on my hand. And the third, inf the third main input is bill of bills of materials. Then we are going to export MRP and come up with a material requirement plan. As I said before, uh, different from the uh, inventory management course, we had better to understand the concept of dependent demand. Independent demand. So we talk about independent demand in inventory management. Okay, now in MRP, we are we will be talking about dependent demand. The difference between independent and dependent demand are, are, is very simple. Independent demand refers to an item refers to a demand to an item which is triggered by external sources, triggered by market, okay? So demand for that kind of items is created external to the company. And we call them parent in the bills, bills of material, okay? And if a bicycle is an independent demand, then dependent demand, as you can understand from its name, the demand depends on this end item. So demands to what 
depends on this bicycle demands two wheel rims demands two pedals demands two seats and all other parts which are called components okay so a wheel rim this wheel rim okay might be used for this type of bicycle or any any kind of other bicycles so that that's why that's why dealing with this kind of demand is very difficult for many years many companies try to manage production and they and the, this kind of dependent demand inventory using independent demand systems okay so, such as eoq models or something like that but it's not it cannot be dealt with, with like this it, you know because the outcome if you use that if you use an eoq model for dependent items the outcome will be really satisfactory because of the the, 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 the structure of the dependent demand okay so um and structure i mean the the relationship between the independent demand the relationship of dependent demand with the independent demand this one causes actually an erratic demand patterns for this kind of components okay. so let's take a look at it again some simple example so this is what we discussed in inventory management and this is the inventory on hand inventory or inventory position information about the bicycle let's say okay so the on hand inventory decreases with demand and this point is let's let's say reorder point okay as soon as the on hand inventory inventory position reaches to reorder point we give an order right and suppose that the order size is 1000 okay so as soon as we give an order for production or to for to order to our supplier and say that hey we need 1000 bicycles then what happens in our either in our production plan or workshop or in our suppliers workshop immediately another demand occurs this this is for this is for wheel rims right one bicycle requires two wheel rims so when i order 1000 bicycles 2000 orders of 2000 orders of wheel rim occurs so a demand appears in my suppliers workshop or in my production workshop okay so this is the relationship between independent and demand information. <clears throat> so another characteristic I would like to mention is this, is this, um, as I said before, wheel rims, a particular wheel rim could be used in different types of, in different models of bicycles. So, the demand to wheel rims will be affected by the demand of the demand of different types of bicycles so at the end the demand to a wheel rim will be in very large amounts so another characteristics of the uh, demand dependent demand on dependent items is clumsy okay in, it means that uh, most of the time it means that um, demand is in large units in, in relatively large units so at the end i would like to highlight that managing managing dependent demand inventors is complicated because again some components may be subject to both demand both dependent and independent demand okay um yes so what we said we said that 
one bicycle requires two wheel rims, right? So what, how about, is there any other components needed to make a bicycle? Of course, yes. So the relationship between these components, these dependent items with the independent items is shown in bills of materials, bills of materials. Bills of materials, okay? So bills of materials is a kind of record of all components of an end item. And it shows the parent and child relationships. So the parent component relationship and their usage quantities. They are derived from engineering and process design. What is the end items? What is an end, end item? End items usually refer to final product sold to the customer. And we, we usually call them parent, okay, not component. It might be even sometimes called work in process uh, from the perspective of accounting, but we usually call them end items, okay? And another category of items in a bill of materials are intermediate items. Intermediate items has at least one parent above it and at least one component below it. I'm gonna show what I mean in a, in a figure in a few minutes, okay? So intermediate items located are located between the low level child and a parent, okay? And these intermediate items are usually referred as working process. Sub assemblies, sub assemblies are also intermediate items, but they are not transformed by other means, okay? They are used as an used in an assembly operation to make, uh, to bring, uh, yeah, to make, to make an, another uh, part. Purchase items, as you can understand from its names, they, they have no components. They are supplied by our suppliers. However, they might have one or more parents. I also would like to introduce this concept. This is, this is a critical concept in many manufacturing companies, especially while uh, especially uh, when they design a new product or when they would like to reduce their um, inventory, components inventory or working process item inventories, they try to increase part commonality. It's also sometimes called standardization of parts or, or modularity, which means, which means the degree to which a component has more than one more than one immediate parent so will a wheel dream could be used in five different types of bicycles when i increase the number of bicycle models that can use a specific a one type of wheel rim it means that we, we, we the part commonality is high so I only need to keep one type of wheel rim to make five different types of 10 different types of bicycles. As the part commonality increases, the level of inventory is expected to decrease. Here's a very simple example. The end item is here is a chair. Okay, this chair requires these components okay and this end item is called a leather back chair leather back chair okay so what is the relationship between this end item and these components how many back legs are required to make one end item how many front legs are required to make one item so this information is shown in bill of materials Bill of material might be seen 
as in a tree diagram like this, tree diagram like this, or it's also sometimes shown in a list. Especially when you open an ERP software or MRP software, we you usually see a list in a list. Okay. So here, item A is ladder back chair called end item, which is the parent. Parent. Okay. So these are the child or children. Okay, so the green blocks B, C, and H are described as intermediate intermediate items. Why they are intermediate items? Because each B, C, and H has a parent and a child, at least one child. Okay, H is a child of C, C and B are children of A. Okay, so this is parent, these are children, children, okay. G and F, G and F are children of B, okay. Items B and C are also called sub-assemblies, B and C. So we are not going to process B and C after we produce them, we are going to assemble them with some other parts okay such as d other components d and e so to make to make the product a we are going to assemble b c d and e why we don't call d and e are sub assemblies they are also sub assemblies but we would like to call them right here purchased items we do not produce them we outsource them okay we buy them from our suppliers such as f g g j and i okay all these gray items gray colored items are purchased items and another information we said that could be seen in a bill of materials is the number of units required to make one unit of parent. So let's 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 take a look at right here. To make one seat frame, to make one seat frame, how many seat frame boards required? Four units of seat frame boards required. Okay. So for one age, we need four j okay let's go up for one seat sub assembly how many h is required one okay so for one c we need one h similarly to make one a we need one c okay so if you if you are going to sell 100 leatherback chairs, if you get an order of 100 leatherback chairs, 100 B is required, 100 C is required, 200 front legs needed, should be purchased, 400 leg supports should be purchased. And let's keep going. To make 100 leather back sub assembly, we need to purchase 200 back legs, 400 back sleds. We need to make 100 seat frames, 100 seat cushion, and last, we need to buy 400 seat frame boards. Do you see the relationship? So you, these these numbers show how many how many units of these components are required to make one parent, okay? To make one of its parent, how many units of that component is required? Okay, so bill of material is, the core is one of the critical input for material requirement planning. And the second one is, 
master production schedule. Master production scheduling is a plan that shows how many end items will be produced within a given period of time. Okay, so it's about end items. We need to know how many how many units of end items need to be produced, need to be need to be produced to meet our customers' orders. Okay, that's why that's why we get sales information from our marketing uh, managers, market uh, sales person, and we also get operations plan and then convert them into specific product schedules. At the end, we expect that sums of quantities in master production schedule must equal sales and operational plan. And because we are not on, we are not producing only one type of SKU, one type of product. We we may our resources, our machinery, machines, equipment, even workforce are used to make different types of products. We have to come up with an efficient production plan, considering these different types of items, and we need to consider the lot sizes, the batch sizes, and even the setup times and some other issues. And we also, of course, need to consider our capacity, right? Capacity and the bottlenecks in manufacturing environments, which they, which limits my capacity. And we will be talking about bottleneck management within a couple of weeks. Well, let's take a look at master production schedule. We said that master production schedule shows the plans of ends items so this is one end item okay it's called a leather back chair in and this is a by the way weekly this is a we, we use a week in a planning period okay so you can use a day or a month for your planning periods but in almost all my all of my examples i use a week as a planning period so in the first week of April, we need 150 leather back chairs so that I can meet my customer order. And similarly, in the week six or in the second week of May, at the beginning of second week of May, I need 150 more to meet my customer demands. So how do I come up with them? Probably using my forecast data or um, plant order, okay? Or some other information we get from our managers. And this is another end item kitchen chair, okay? So I need to make 120 kitchen chair at the beginning of week four and week seven. And similarly for desk chair, when I aggregate all, I can say that in April, I need to produce 670 chairs because I aggregated all different types of SKUs, okay? Now, in, I'm talking about chair family, okay? I need to make 670 chairs in April and May. So how did I get this number? By adding all these numbers. Let's let's take a look at how we can develop MPS for only one SK, only one product. In step one, in step one, we need to know how many units we have on our hand. So we need to calculate projected on-hand inventories. Projected on-hand inventories at the end of this week, at the end of a week, is equal to on-hand inventory at the end of previous week, last week, or last period, plus MPS quantity due at start of this week, so the amount of production in this week, minus projected requirements of this week. So on-hand inventory, so how many units come from last week, plus how many we produced this week, 
and minus how many required. Okay. So how can we calculate requirements? Requirements, projected requirements, are equal to maximum of forecast or forecast or customer orders book. So this this kind of system works very well for the companies who apply make the stock strategy. Okay, and as we discussed before, um, in make the stock strategy, we may forecast, right? Using our time series data or using our experience or collect information, collect data from the market and so on, okay? So we have a projection. We expect to sell, let's say, 100 units in the next month. But sometimes, sometimes our customers might book more than our forecast. Then, of course, we should definitely use that number, right? Our forecast says we are planning to sell 100 units in the next month, but already our customers said that, hey, we want to buy 200 units. So the new number is 200 units anymore. If the booked orders are less than the forecast, we I need to plan my production according to my forecast because it's, it, it, it is greater than the booked orders. That's why it says maximum of either forecast or customer orders. So for example, Let's say that we have 55 chairs on hand and there is no production in week one. However, the forecast is 38 chairs or 38 chairs already promised for delivery in week one. So at the end of week one, we will have 17 chairs in our inventory. Okay, let's do this in, show this in a table. At the beginning of April, we have 55 chairs. What kind of chair? Ladder back chair. As I said before, this is only for one SKU, okay? And our forecast for each week is 30 chairs. We expect to sell 30 chairs every week in April. So, so I have that many chairs and that's my forecast. However, even though this is my forecast, I already got an order about 38 chairs. My customers already ordered 38 chairs. So I'm going to use, of course, this one, right? Not my forecast, because 38 is greater than 30. So I'm going to consider my on-hand inventory and subtract this amount from my inventory and calculated projected on hand inventory so at the end of week one in april in april i expect to have 17 units 17 chairs in my stock why i didn't subtract mps quantity because it's a zero so i'm not planning to produce any chair in the first week of april okay so this is now this is now ending inventory in week one, which can be used for the orders in the week two. And in week two, we already got 27 chairs as an order. However, our forecast is 30. So my plan will be done according to my forecast. I have 17 units on my hand. The forecast is 30 units. So if I do not make any, if I do not make any chair at the beginning of first two, my inventory will be minus 13. What it means, it means that I will be, I will have, I will be in stock out. So I, I'm not going to be able to meet some of my customers order according to my forecast. So which gives me a signal that you have to produce chairs. Right, you have to make some chairs. So that's what we will develop in later on. In the second step, according to those signals, we are going to determine the timing and the size of MPS quantities, master production schedule quantities. So we want to avoid stock out. Okay. In order to avoid stock out, we need to produce. In order to avoid my negative 
inventory we need to produce how many how many units we need to produce and when we should produce that's what we are going to determine in step two okay so this is how we calculated inventory and this is the mps quantity if the order if the production order if the lot size is 150 and if we have 17 chairs on hand and if the forecast is third right now then at the end of week two we will have 137 chairs let's take a look at and see all these information and when to produce and how much produce in an mps schedule this is the previous table and for this item for leather back chair the order policy is 150 units okay so every time we produce a leather chair we produce in 150 units and in how many weeks we produce that many leather chairs in one week this is a production lead time okay so let's review this table at the beginning of the month april week one we have 55 on hand and according to my forecast and book orders i am going to sell 38 so my projected inventory is 15 because there is no production okay so 55 plus 0 minus 35 is 70 okay the second week this is my forecast this is my customer's book order I'm going to consider my forecast because which is greater than 27. I have 17 on my hand, 17 on my hand. It is not enough to meet this demand, right? It's not so, I need to produce. Given production order, 150 units. Why 150 units? Because this is my order policy, okay? So then, then 150 plus 17 167 minus forecast 137 will be on my hand at the end of week two okay then in week three this is my forecast this is my customer's book order so this is greater than customer books order so can i meet this forecast from my inventory yes i can because my on hand inventory project on hand inventory is greater than this so subtract this third from 137 and then get 107 it's gonna be the on hand inventory at the end of week three okay similarly we keep going on that so i can meet that forecast from my inventory subtract 30 and get 70 okay so there is no booked order so from now on i'm only going to consider my forecast can i meet my forecast from my stock yes subtract 37 and 42 okay can i meet that forecast more from my stock yes at the end of week six i will have seven chairs on my hand can i meet that forecast from my inventory from my stock no it's not possible because it's less than 35 so then what should i do i should give a production order right the amount of 150 so 150 plus 7 157 minus 35 will be will give projected on hand inventory at the end of week seven okay and then when you subtract this one you will get a projected inventory at the end of week eight this is what it means so these are the number of units we should have at the beginning of week two and week seven otherwise i cannot meet my customer orders okay what did we say before it takes one week to produce 150 units of chair then then this mps should start at the beginning of week one this mps should start at the beginning of week seven what did it means i have to store start to assemble all the components of this chair to make start at the beginning of week one to assemble the components to make these required units ready at the beginning of week four or week two. Similarly, I had to start to assemble all the components at the beginning of week six to make them ready at the beginning of week 
seven in order to avoid stroke out. Okay, another important concept is available to promise, ATP, okay? Let's take a look what it means. Available to promise means that when your salesperson talks to the customer and a customer wants to give an order, the salesperson can promise that ATP units of his orders can be immediately met. So, in other words, we have that many units on our hand. So, if we receive an order, customer orders, I can meet it immediately. How do we calculate it? Uh, for the first week, it is uh, the calculation is slightly different from the other weeks. Okay, for the first week, we are going to consider our on hand inventory and the maximum of forecast and customers book order. So because for the first week, we do not produce anything, okay? Uh, what is the maximum of this one? 38, okay? So 38 units, suppose that 38 units are already sold. So when I subtract 38 from 55, I get 17. So I have 17 units on my hand. If my salesperson gets an order up to 17 units, I can immediately deliver it. Okay, I do not need to produce any chairs. However, if he gets more than 17, then I cannot meet them immediately, right? I have to create a production order, right? This is for the first week. Let's take a look at for the other weeks. For the other weeks, we need to consider all the customers book order up to the next next MPS. The next MPS is right here, okay? Up to this point, we need to consider all of the customer's books order and then subtract them from the MPS quantity. Why we do that? Because <clears throat> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple idea. This is how much I will, how many I will produce at the beginning of week two. And these are the units already booked. So when I subtract these numbers from 150, I, can, I say this. If you get order af after the beginning of week two till week six, okay? Or, yeah, uh, if you get an order after the beginning of week two, and if that order is less than 91, okay, no problem. I can immediately give a promise that I can meet your order, okay? So they are available, 91 units are available. So you can go ahead and promise your customers that I can meet that many units immediately. And this concept is available to promise inventory. So this information is very good, is very critical for your salesperson. Okay, uh, it's also explained right, right here, okay? Uh, as, I, as I said before, master production schedule uh, is a plan for end items. Um, these schedules are very critical for companies who applies make to stock strategies, and these plans are not, um, are rarely changed because because it's very because it's very costly to change. Okay, so if you change the amount in your master production schedule, then you may face with high cost. I uh, for for instance, if you if you decide to increase the number of units you produce, you need to expedite expedite your production. For expedi expedi expedition, okay, expedition. So you need to, be, you may need to create another shift, or you you may need uh, your workers to work overtime. So the work, the, the cost of the labor cost will increase, right? The labor because we know that overtime labor cost is not the same as regular time labor cost, right? It's almost fifty percent more than than the regular time, right? So for expedition, so you need to have higher cost. 
Okay, so that's why most of the companies freeze their master production schedule after they come up with or make on the small changes. Okay, and another important issue for master production schedule is that it should be synchronized. It should be synchronized with the sales and operations plans. Okay, so as we said before, one of the important one of the important um, input for master production schedule is our forecast or um, operations plan in our manufacturing plans. Right, so we need to consider them. Um, yeah, let's let's take let's do a, another example to make it clear. In this example, we are going to determine MPS for product A, and the, the policy, the order policy is 50 units. So every time we produce product A, we are going to produce 50 units, 50 units. And suppose that we have 55 units on hand at the beginning of planning horizon, okay? And all other information is given in the table, and lead time for this production is one week. And this is the order policy, this is the lead time for production, this is for product A, this is on hand inventory at the beginning of planning horizon, and these are our forecasts, and these are already booked orders, okay? So, how, what is the projected on hand inventory? It's easy to calculate for the first pick. I do have that much inventory, and because booked orders is greater than forecast, I'm gonna consider this one, and projected orders will be 55 minus 30, 25 right so can i meet can i meet the, the the requirement in second week from my inventory on my on hand inventory the maximum the maximum requirement is determined by customer orders book in week two so i can easily meet it right so the projected inventory will be five can i meet the requirement in week three from my inventory no five is less than 40 so I need to give a MPS order, right? I need an MPS, MPS, I'm sorry, MP, MPS right here. And I need to give an MPS order one week before this because of lead time, okay? And let me do one more. And I, I will have 50 chairs at the beginning of week three and five chairs from, the, from week two I will have 55 chairs at the beginning of week three, and my forecast is 40, and I subtract it, I will have 15 units on my hand at the end of week three. So can I meet requirement week four from my inventory? Yes, because my forecast is 10. So I will have five units on my hand at the end of week four. And no forecast at week four, week five, so on hand inventory will be the same. No forecast at six, seven. However, we already have booked order in, in two, two units booked order. So I can meet it from my stock. And then the remaining inventory on hand inventory will be three. I'm sorry, I cannot meet week seven forecast from my inventory. So I need an MPS. I'm sorry, I need an MPS right here. Okay and to have 50 product A, I need to give its order one week before it, okay? When I get 50 units, I will, I also have three units and subtract 30, I will have 23 units on my hand at the end of week seven, okay? When you do that, you will get this master production schedule. Okay, let's also calculate available to promise order for the first week. After we get this, okay, after we get this, we can easily calculate available to promise order. At the beginning, we have 55 units on hand, 30 units are booked, right? 30 units are booked, and the next the next MPS, the next MPS occur right here. The next MPS, so the next production 
the next production or the next batch, the next lot will arrive to my shop at the beginning of week three. So until that time, until that time, I have to meet my customer orders from my on-hand inventory, beginning initial on-hand inventory. So up to this point, how many units are booked? 50 units are booked. So I already sold 50 units. If I have 55 units on my hand, if I already sold 50 units, I have five units excessive, right? So this is the amount of units I can promise to my customers that I can deliver it immediately. That's why this number is five, okay? Up to this point, until I receive the next production, next MPS, I can only give five units as a promise to meet. And then the next MPS will be right here, right? The next MPS, the next batch will arrive at the beginning of week seven. So until, until week seven, how many units of product A I can promise my customers to meet immediately? So for this purpose, let's calculate booked orders up to that point, starting from week three and ending at the beginning of week seven. So total booked orders are eight plus two, 10 plus five, 15, okay? So already 15 units booked orders, okay? So how many I produce right here? 50. 50 minus 15, available to promise units at the beginning of week three is 35, okay? So I can promise my customer that, that I can deliver 35 units of product A immediately as soon as I receive an order. And for the rest, you can do it at home. Okay. And another input, another critical input for MRP calculation is inventory records. We need to have up-to-date, accurate inventory records, okay? And inventory records are updated as soon as we do transactions. Transactions such as releasing new orders or receiving scheduled receipts, or adjusting due dates for scheduled receipts, withdrawing inventory, canceling orders, or correcting inventory errors after cycle counting, rejecting shipments, and some other, other types of transactions. Okay. And these informations are updated in a time phase data. Uh, time phase information include these records, gross requirements, scheduled report, receipts, and projected on hand inventory. Okay. Hence, as we did it before, projected on hand inventory balance at the end of week T is calculated inventory on hand at the end of week T minus one or at the beginning of week T. Okay. Plus, how many units we will receive at the, in the week T, these are scheduled receipts or planned receipts, minus how much required in the week T, okay? Let's take a look at an example problem and see, see how we uh, update inventory information in a table. These calculations belong to the calculations in the next slide, this one. Okay, so this is for item C, intermediate item C. Uh, it's a seat subassembly. It is lot size, 200 units. It means that every time we produce item C, we produce in 230 units, and it takes two weeks to make it. 
At the beginning of the planning horizon, we have 37 units on hand. And in week one, we need to have 150 units. So at the beginning of week one, we need to have 150 units of item C, okay, to be able to make its parents. And I already gave an order in previous weeks. So at the beginning of week one, I will receive 230 units. So 230 units will be available in week one because I ordered in advance, okay, in previous weeks. So this one will be on my hand. This is already in the stock. So the, it gives me, is to give me the total available stock, right? 267. After I consume 150, the projected inventory will be 107. So at the end of week one, there will be 117 seed sub, seed sub assembly in my stock. No required, no requirement, no scheduled receipt, no requirement, no scheduled receipt. So the on hand inventory will be the same. At the, in week four, I also need to have 120 seed sub assembly. Why? Because they will be used for its parents, right? for this assembly operation. Can I meet this order from my stock? No, no, right, I cannot meet it. So how much I need it? So what's gonna be my inventory information? Inventory information will be 117 minus 120 because there is also no schedules received. So negative information. So I will, unfortunately, I will have three units stock out. Similarly, no scheduled receipts, no gross requirements. Still, I am in back order. And another 150 is required at the be in week six. Because I have nothing on my hand, I cannot meet it. So the amount of inventory will be minus 153, which gives a sign of that you should have that much unit beforehand. 120 is also required. So these are the inventory records, okay? Okay. So in order to avoid, Okay, in order to avoid these minus negative stocks, what should we do? Of course, we should give an order, right? We should give an order of seed as assembly and receive a new batch to meet, to keep up with our production plans. So in order to avoid this negative inventory, I should have something on my hand at the beginning of week four, right? How many? Of course, how many? 230 units. So the 230 units should be available at the beginning of week four. If this should be available at the, in the beginning of week, at the beginning of week four, when should uh, when should give this order because its lead time is two weeks two weeks before so 230 units of item c should be ordered at the beginning of week two then they can be prepared within two weeks and i can deliver it at the beginning of week four then my inventory goes to positive 227, okay? So the next table shows that information. And then 
then of course the remaining weeks should be updated according to new, this new inventory records okay and there is another order should be given right here but i'll leave the remaining up to you in the next lecture uh, so up to now we have talked about bill of materials master production scheduling also the concept of dependent demand for the master production scheduling we said that there are three types of critical inputs we need to consider inventory record up-to-date inventory records master production scheduling which is synchronized with sales and operations planning information and the bill of sales master schedule event, yeah, and the third one is the bill of material information okay in the next lecture i will be talking about lot size policies and mrp explosion okay um yeah have a nice day <laughs>